though. It's a little bit, um, it's not weird, but it's not super high yield, but there's some really random facts that do come up, like specific temperatures and times. So I'll go through those with you. Um, these are the learning objectives. I approach this one more, this is unlike the other micro lectures, it's not like a general understanding. These are particular points to know. So I put these here. This first one is quite easy. It's a chain of infection. So there's an a reservoir that's secreting the infectious agent. Then um, there's a portal of entry. Um, yeah, and then that's going to get exited through the portal of exit. And the portal of exit is the same as the portal of entry. So what it comes out of, it can go into, and that's going to occur through a transmission. And usually it's going to affect susceptible hosts. So susceptible hosts aren't just like immunocompromised people. That's not what susceptible means. Susceptible hosts are just people who can develop that condition in that particular time. Yeah, it's all good. What are you doing? Uh, an infectious agent is the causative pathogen that causes these infections. So good to have a general idea. I, yeah, just go reservoir is secretes the pathogen. Then the portal of exit and portal of entry are the same. So gets out transmission septal host. Um, I made a little summary of it. So the reservoir, one second, I'm just going to tell my family to be quiet. Okay, all good. Um, so the reservoir is the source of the human infection. You can have human carriers, so they can either be symptomatic, spreading the disease like through coughing and being sick, or they can just be asymptomatic carriers, which is a lot harder to control. Um, you can also have a reservoir of infection through animals. It can um, cross-react and go into humans or through objects. So fomites can, a fomite is a word for an object that has a pathogen. You touch the object with that pathogen, you touch your face and you can get it. Um, this next step here is portal of entry. This is um, before transmission and after reservoir. However, it's the same as a portal of exit. So you can also put portal of exit, like it has to go out of the person through their portal of exit. Then it has to be transmitted. Transmission can either be through contact, which is direct. So that's like skin to skin, sexual or sexual, or indirect, which is if you cough, someone walks into those suspensory particles, breathes it in or through those fomites. You can also have inoculation through insect bites and sharp injuries, such as with needles or IV drug use through droplets, airborne, vehicles. Vehicles just refer to like objects that carry the pathogen. So that can be in water and food, like in hepatitis A. It can be on medical equipment. And it also overlaps a little bit with indirect transmission because there's similar objects, but it's a little bit different because vehicles also refer to environments that support the growth of pathogens. So usually like more wet, damp environments or vehicles. Well, it can also be spread to the fetus through transplacental route. Then another arrow from transmission going to portal of, it can be exit or entry. In this case, we'll do portal of exit. You can go through your respiratory, your genital, GIT, skin or placenta. And that's going to then go to a susceptible host who either has underlying disease, antibiotics, invasive diseases, extreme age, or they're just in that position to be infected and then it cycles again. Then that person is gonna become the reservoir. It's gonna go through the portal of exit. It's going to be transmitted. It's then gonna go through a portal of entry and then it's gonna affect a susceptible host. Hopefully that makes sense. and isn't too difficult to remember. Not super high yield, but you kind of get a general idea. It's a bit common sense. So a lot of this lecture is focused on the healthcare center healthcare setting. And in doing so, it talks about three ways to make sure you minimize the spread of pathogens. So one is through cleaning. Cleaning occurs prior to disinfection and sterilization. These are words you should know. Cleaning is just like when you clean dishes, you just wash in, soak in hot water, soap or detergent. It's just that usual cleaning to control microbial growth. Then what you can do is these are more particular to the hospital environment. You have disinfection, which is removing or killing most viable organisms. And you, that can be through antiseptics for the skin or through physical by boiling water. And you can have sterilization, which is all viable organisms, whereas disinfection is just most. And that can again be via physical or chemical routes and lead to the destruction of all microbial life. Often many agents that cause disinfection in very high quantities can lead to sterilization. So it's not just black and white, it's just these kind of 
um, vague definitions of most killing most, killing all. Cleaning is just what occurs before. And just a definition, because I used the word antisepsis. Antisepsis is just removing microbes from the skin. You probably cut yourself and you put betadine on it. That was antisepsis. Um, here are some risk factors. So if you have an equipment penetrated in the mucous membrane or skin of an individual, that is going to need to be sterilized because it's going into kind of immune privileged sites. There shouldn't be any bacteria in your blood. It shouldn't be inside of you. So it's not good enough to have most of the viral organisms gone. You want all of the viral organisms gone. Um, similar, um, even equipment going in the body, if there's no penetration, like endoscopy or respiratory equipment, it, it does vary, but you usually want to sterilize that. You don't want um, pathogens in the base of people's lungs that can cause pneumonia and be unpleasant. Um, more with contact with the skin, but doesn't penetrate. So like um, your blood pressure cuff, so your um, stethoscope, you just can, you can disinfect that or you can clean that or clean and then disinfect. And it's also important that this is the most high yield from this lecture. It's talked about a lot. One second, I'm just gonna charge my computer. It's talked about a lot, a lot and that is the um, to disinfect hands between patients. So it's very important you wash your hands and then you can use alcohol wipes to disinfect. So the best way to control the spread of infection in the hospital environment is through sterilizing, disinfecting. And the thing you can do is through cleaning, washing your hands. Sterilization, there's two ways you can sterilize. This is the most high yield part of this lecture. This was in a lot of exams. I have absolutely no idea why, but it is. Um, you have two types of heat sterilization, moist heat and dry heat. Moist heat is more efficient and effective than dry heat. You're only going to do dry heat if you can't really do moist heat, you can't get wet like that. Um, often you use an autoclave to have moist heat and pressure. At 121 degrees, you put it in for 15 minutes. At 134 degrees, you put it in 3.5 minutes. The reason why these temperatures change is the more pressure you have, the higher the boiling point of the substance, or the, like the higher the boiling point of water. So you need to increase the pressure when you increase the temperature when you increase pressure to get that same, same um, killing effect. It kills bacteria cells, virus sores, and endospores through denaturation. These numbers, if you only remember one thing, remember these numbers and remember these numbers and you should be fine. Dry heat is when oxidation leads to the deactivation of cell components, often use hot air ovens, 170 degrees for one hour, 160 degrees for two hours. Um, ways to remember this, the higher temperature needs to be in for less minutes because it kills it quicker. Good way to remember it. And I just thought 170 and 160 were nicer whole numbers, like they're of the tens, so they're going to be one and two because they're nice numbers. And this, I just you just got to remember 15 and 3.5, unfortunately. 134, 3.5, similar, like three plus, ready, hold on. Three and then four plus one is five, so 3.5 for 134. And um, yeah, that's all I got, so I might just have to learn that one. Um, you can also have sterilization through radiation. This is a little bit confusing. There's lots of different types of radiation, electromagnetic radiation based on the wavelength of the light. Um, sterilization, often you can also disinfect or sterilize depending on the intensity of the radiation. But in the regards to sterilization, UV light can disinfect or sterilize, but it's um, especially used for disinfecting because it's not very good at penetrating. So it is used for disinfecting as well. It's often used to disinfect instrument surfaces and water in hospitals. Um, ionizing gamma radiation, that's a bit stronger, more used for your sterilization. But it can also be used for disinfection. It produces free radicals, which break down DNA. And this is for heat sensitive materials. Your first protocol is moist heat. You can't do that dry heat, you can't do that irradiation. Next, you only do filtration if you can't do anything else. Infiltration is when you physically remove microorganisms from heat sensitive liquids or gases, and it's integrated in intravenous therapy, peritoneal dialysis, and solution for surgical irrigation. So, if you need to put dialysis or fluid into a person, it's important you don't radiate that fluid, number one. And if you heat it, it's going to evaporate and change the concentration. So, you sometimes you need to do filtration. This is just some examples. Again, um, objects entering sterile tissue or vascular system. Um, need to be free of microorganisms, including spores. So sterilization is required. 
and it says surgical instruments, catheters, needles, the ones that reach mucous membrane as before. Do you remember before I said like that respiratory equipment, it also needs to be sterilized. The difference between it and something that is invasive is that there can be a low number of spores. That's acceptable. And that's just in contact. It shouldn't penetrate them. And that's like your endoscopes and laryngoscopes. And your intermediate and low-level disinfection is non-critical items that may come in contact with the skin, the non-mucous membranes, stethoscopes, crutches, blood pressure. We spoke about that. So again, antisepsis for sterilization of the skin. You've got chlorhexidine and iodine. These are the two main options. And it's really clinical preference, which one people prefer. Um, yeah. So um, when you disinfect, it's important that it isn't soil, it's completely free of dirt, which is why often you clean it first. And yeah, obviously I, the one I didn't put in is it says the whole object has to be immersed. I thought that was pretty common sense. It has to be immersed for sufficient time and has sufficient concentration of the disinfectant. Just some glossary terms that might confuse you, so don't get stuck up on these. Antiseptic is a chemical disinfectant for use on living tissues. Disinfectant can be living or non-living tissues. Antiseptic is living tissues. Sanitization is to thoroughly clean to remove most microorganisms. Sanitization does not imply disinfectant, which is removal of most organisms as well. This is more of a clean in and is not as technical a term as disinfectant. Asepsis is just the attempt to prevent microbes from getting to a patient. These are some hospital acquired infections. Um, often opportunistic infections are Staph aureus and E. coli. The most common nosocomial infection are urinary tract infections, often through the placement of catheters. Some pathogens in a hospital carry antibiotic resistant because in a hospital environment, they're exposed to really um, virulent diseases. They, through those feline fimbriae, they can share plasmids, which give it some antibiotic resistance and can be quite hard to treat. Transmission can occur either from the patient itself, so you can get wipe the catheter against the patient's legs, get some staph aureus, and then you put the catheter inside the urinary tract. Another way it can work is you cannot wash your hands after seeing a patient with pneumonia and touch an immunocompromised patient and give them pneumonia. Hand washing is the most high yield, as well as these temperatures. Next lecture. Okay, this lecture was absurd. It was really, really hard. So don't worry if you get confused when you watch it. You haven't done anatomy yet. So a lot of this is gonna go over your head. So I'll do my best to make it make sense. So this lecture is about infective endocarditis, primarily pericarditis and myocarditis. Itis refers to an inflammation and um, that's really all you need to know. So endocarditis refers to an inflammation of the innermost layer that lines the heart. The heart is a structure or an organ that looks like this, and it's involved in pumping blood from your venous circulation through to your systemic arterial circulation. So your veins drain into this right atrium and they get pumped up. Right? Atrium is like a room. You have two rooms, so two atriums, left atrium and right atrium and they fall into left ventricles and right ventricles. Ventricles are like pumps that which then push it out to be simplistic. So these push it out, this left side pushes up to the arterial circulation, right side accepts from the venous circulation. The heart is lined in a fibrous connective tissue because you don't want it to move around too much. You want to keep it in place. You have myocardium because that's just made up of muscle so it can contract and you have endocardium, which is this thin layer that lines the heart and the valves of the heart. So there are some valves at each, um, I'll show you in a second actually. But just important, we're just focusing the inner layer of the heart. I didn't know what endocardium was, so this whole lecture didn't make sense for you. So could we say that? Um, this is another image, just because it's really important you recognize endocardium is the inner layer of the heart. Um, as you can see in this image, you have some veins going into this right atrium. And then you have a valve, a valve over here. And this valve is the tricuspid valve. It is made up of endometrium. Then this atrium, and then the ventricle is separated from this pulmonary trunk, which is gonna to go to the lungs by another valve. So each of these rooms are separated by valves or doors. And infective endocarditis is in damage to these valves due to bacterial growth. Depending on the type of bacteria, different valves will be in, affected. So if your staph aureus is coming through someone I, using IV drugs, those bugs are going to come in and they're going to get caught at the tricuspid valve 
and they're going to vegetate and grow over here. And then after they've grown, they're going to go through this heart, through the circulation, and they're going to flick off into different capillary beds through the body, shooting um, bacteria that can clot blood vessels and lead to infarction, which is when you have infarction is when the blood vessel is occluded, so the tissue isn't sufficiently perfused and they, they can, um, tissue can die. So this is a patient's anatomy. The most affected valve is the mitral valve, most commonly. And um, yeah, you can see here a vegetation, how it looks different. And that's due to an infection of the endocardium. Hopefully now you have a vague sense of what endocardium is. So when I talk about valves, you know what I'm talking about, which I didn't when I listened to this lecture. Infective endocarditis is the condition we are talking about. I broke it up into four ways to understand it. First is the pathophysiology. It's just an infection of the inner surface of the heart where heart valves are most commonly affected. It's often caused by bacteria, such as staph aureus, oral streps, coagulas, coagulase next stuff. And it can also be caused by flora in certain areas. So if you have a dental procedure and you have strep mutans and viridans in your teeth, those get knocked out into your bloodstream. They circulate around. They get pumped up through the venous return. They can go to your heart and they can colonize on a valve. Um, presentation, presentation can be acute or subacute. If it's very aggressive, presents in the course of days, like Staph aureus, it'll be highly virulent organisms. It'll be acute. Subacute can be slow indolent, weak to mouth, low virulence organisms such as Enterococcus or Viridans, which is the teeth one we spoke about. Usually, yeah, classically, it presents with a bacteremia or fungemia. The word emia means in the blood. Bacteremia is a lot common in native valves. Often people get their valves replaced for various reasons. A prosthetic valve is more susceptible to fungemia. Bacteria, bacteria infection is still more common, but a fungal infection is more common in a prosthetic valve than it is in a native valve. Um, it can lead to peripheral emboli because those bacterial colonizations are flicking off into vascular beds. And we'll explain these in the signs and symptoms. Risk factor is the biggest one, buzzword injecting drug use. If you need to know anything from this, that's on exams, learn that. Um, prosthetic valves are a risk factor, heart diseases, cardiac devices, and skin infections. And this often occurs due to pathogens being introduced to the skin via IV drug use. Pacemakers, infections, floral. So two ways to divide it via skin, IV drug use, via oral cavity, dental treatment, and um, streptococcus viridans is a buzzword. That's probably going to be in your exams. Um, this is just going through the valves of the house heart again. Again, very sensitive that you haven't done any heart stuff, so try and be as clear as possible. Your venous system is draining into your right atrium. That's going to go through your tricuspid valve into your right ventricle. Your right ventricle is going to pump it to your lungs. It's going to be, get oxygenated in your lungs, and then you're going to have oxygenated blood. That's going to be returned to the left atrium. The left atrium is going to through, go through the mitral valve and be pumped out of the aortic valve, where it will go to the systemic circulation. Important to know, mitral valve is involved in 41%, aortic valve in 38%. These are the most commonly involved valves. The only other one you need to know, which I might actually, I'm going to put this in because it's super important and I should put it in, is IV drug use. Because it's put into the veins, Really important to know that piece of information that it can also affect the tricuspid valve, although it doesn't do, do this as commonly. Mitral and mitral and aortic are the most common. These are some signs and symptoms. Again, quite high yield, probably examinable, and definitely talked about in clinical exams. These are due essentially to two reasons. Um, where are they? essentially it's due to emboli emboli is the flicking off the bacteria leading to that infarction or due to an immunological response so a splinter hemorrhage is when a piece of bacteria is flicked off or clots or a clot or a bacteria flicks off goes into the systemic capillary bed these capillaries are quite small it blocks them off and then you get these little splinter hemorrhages of blood going through the nails. You can also get them in not in infective endocarditis. I saw I had them once and I thought I had infective endocarditis. Um, you can also have rough spots. These are in the eyes. 
Also the nodes are tender to touch. Janeway lesions look like this in conjunctive, but to here, just like bruised on the eye. Is there a question? Sorry, what do you do mean by user stack? Good question. Ah, uh, I mean, IV drug use. Commonly introduces staph aureus. Does that make sense? Thanks for, thanks for double checking with that. No worries. Um, so these are some complications, stroke and heart failure also um, high risk factors because these are caused, as you haven't learned yet, by clots occluding perfusion to the coronary arteries. Coronary arteries perfuse the heart. That causes MI, so myocardial infarction to heart attack. Stroke is a clot can lead to a lack of blood supply to the brain. Heart failure is when the um, heart is pumping really hard and not as effectively. You'll learn about that a lot in detail soon. Blood culture, important to know, most important diagnostic tool in infective endocarditis. Often you have three tests with first and last at least one hour apart. Um, now there's another sort of criteria, which is less high yield, which is called Duke's criteria. And it's divided into two major indicators or minor indicators. You can have two major indicators, one major, three minors, or five minors for a diagnosis. The two major ones are positive blood culture and echocardiogram positive for infective endocarditis. That's probably could be, I've seen that before. So try learn those two. The rest are less high yield. Minor are more risk factors and signs that are indirect. Whereas majors like the antibodies to it, or you can see it in culture. Causes with native valves, most almond staph aureus in nosocomial and non nosocomial setting. Does anyone know what nosocomial means? Exactly. So nosocomial is hospital acquired infection. Coagulase negative staph is the next most common, very rare to get fungi, and blood culture are usually positive. With a prosthetic valve or a valve replacement, staph aureus is the most common as well, especially in early infective endocarditis, kind of equalizes a bit in late endocarditis. Fungi is increased substantially in frequency, and the blood cultures are high in negative results, frequency than in native valves. Staph aureus, particularly in injecting drug use, is the most common, common causative agent, especially in native valves, buzzwords, staph aureus, injecting drug use, and probably tricuspid. But remember, tricuspid isn't the most common. Mitral and aortic valves are the most common. Coagulative negative staph can also cause. There's a variety of them. I just put in staph epidermidis, which is related to prosthetic valve endocarditis. And it's commonly found on the skin. Is normal flora. Streptococci and enterococci. Um, these enterococci are often in the GI flora in the gut, such as strep bovis or enterococci. And... Um, we can also have dental strep mutans. Important to know that a very frequent question is they'll ask someone just underwent a dental procedure, what is probably the causative agent? There's two I'm thinking of. Can anyone think of them? Very hard question. But yeah, so one is strep mutans. The other one is strep viridans. That's very high yield. That will be asked and the enterococci in the gut. So if it says it comes from the gut or is perforated gut or something like that, then you know it's enterococci. These are associated with weight loss and resistance to therapy. And yeah, if it says it's from the skin, you say staph aureus, gut enterococci, etc. Fungi is particularly common in injecting drug use as well, um, particularly candida albicans and aspilogus. If you have prolonged IV antibiotics, you're more susceptible to it because you often need a weakened immune system because these are in the normal flora and they can affect native valves. Poor prognosis, very poor prognosis of fungal infections and fungaremia, and they often acquire surgery. Um, there's an opioid epidemic, which is related to that drug use and rising infective endocarditis and drug-associated endo infective endocarditis in Victoria. Right infective endocarditis is more common than left. There's more complications associated with that. Um, this is just a quick thing. They have one 
slide on each of these, but it's one of the dot points so I put it in. Myocarditis is an infection of the muscle in the heart, can lead to sudden death in the young through direct cellular damage, cytotoxicity of toxins, and non-specific damage to adjacent tissues. And um, pericarditis is inflammation of that fibrous pericardium that holds the um, heart in place, often caused by Coxsackie disease. The bacteria is purulent, which means pus producing. That's particularly dangerous. You can imagine in a fiber, if you have a fibrous tissue and you're producing pus, you're building up pressure, which can lead to heart failure because the heart can't expand as much to contract. Um, TB can be a cause as well and can be acute or chronic. And I've just put here that either through systemic, hematogenous or lymphatic drainage, Viruses are usually metagenous, bacteria and TB can be systemic. TB can be lymphatic as well, bacteria as well, just in, in, through the blood. And it can also be contiguous. So contiguous just means it shares a common border and sequence of time. So it comes from the chest, the chest is close to the heart, so it just moves through there. And TB can be from the lung, just moves through. Wait, right, more common than left. Oh yeah, so that was for complications. Mitral and aortic valves are more common, but for the complications, um, right side it is more than left. Uh, I might just take that out because that's not helpful. I'll just do more complications. Yeah, I can see why that's confusing. Don't worry about that. Sorry about that. That was just in reference to complications. Um, the reason why is the venous, so arterial pressure is a lot higher pressure than venous pressure. So Bacteria can colonize easier in low pressure environments. So in that right atrium, you have a low pressure environment and it's a very common site for the formation of clots. Whereas in the atrium, you can imagine it's like the highest pressure of blood in your body. So it's a lot harder for um, vegetation there. So often the complications are a little bit less severe than in the right where it can be huge clots, including everything. Hope that makes sense. Thank you for bringing that up. Makes a lot of sense, awesome. Rheumatic fever is also, um, it comes, you have a whole kind of micro on it later. It used to be a lot more prevalent in the wall. My great grandfather died of this in the wall. Um, it usually occurs two to four weeks after group A streptococcus, throat infection. And that's because the antibodies against strep pyogeny, so another name for strep pyogeny is group A streptococcus, the antibodies against it are very, very, very similar to, sorry, the antigen of strep pyogenase is very similar to the antigen in um, the valves of the heart for some reason. So there's a cross reactivity between the antibodies to this pyogenase and to the antibodies in the heart. And it's like an autoimmune condition. So type four hypersensitivity, is it not? I've completely forgotten. I think it is, don't worry about that. That comes later, but yeah. Ignore that type four hypersensitivity. It's just an immune condition where the antibodies get mistaken and they react against the heart disease. I just need to watch more of my lectures, but the second year. Pharmacology is what is next. Last one, not too hard. Richard Yeager's lecture is fantastic lecture, centrally acting analgesics. <sighs> to understand analgesics, we need to understand pain. Pain is transmitted by three primary fibers. C fibers often lead to a sustained, really noxious chemical. It's quite painful and chronic. It's um, slow and dull and longer duration, quite difficult to endure and unpleasant. Um, it was also a Zoom last year, which was pretty cool. Fast pain is when you like touch a fast object and your finger goes back to that reflex arc. So it's a sharp, pricking, localized, short duration, less emotional overtone. That kind of just refers to ability to endure it. Like it's very emotionally tolerant of chronic pain. And it's transported by alpha um, delta fibers, I think. Couldn't tell you. I did special and I should know that. These fibers, whereas... Um, C fibers carry the second pain. Don't worry too much about mechanical stimulus. All pain fibers enter through the dorsal horn, which is the sensory. You have your dorsal root ganglia in here, whereas the nucleus, these are bipolar nuclear, I think. Sometimes, but that doesn't matter. Ignore that. They go through here, synapse here, and they go to the, they have their cell body here. They synapse in this dorsal horn where they can then go through ascending tracks to be made sense of upstream. These are some ascending tracks. The one relevant for here is the spinothalamic. How much do we need to know about referred pain sites? Um, they still teach that to us. So um, it's important, but it's not majorly high yield. 
the main thing to know about referred pay, you'll learn it, you'll literally learn it in a week. But the reason, actually you would have learned it in upper and lower limb and it was quite confusing. But the reason why it occurs is for some reason, fibers originating from the same nerve root can sometimes get confused and cross react. So if you have, what's an example? Okay, if you have a heart, is it worth it? 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 Okay, so some structures in your body have nerve roots that come from C3, C4, C5. And those nerve roots descend down to your diaphragm. If you have irritation of your diaphragm, it travels up those nerve roots. And then when it goes up through those ascending pathways, it gets confused in that transmission and your body confuses it with the dermatomes for C3, C4, C5. So it goes by your, um, by your, like your C3, C4, C5 dermatome. So that's why, what's the question? You'll learn this in CVS, yeah. So the, why, the reason why this is really important and why you should know it is if you have an acute myocardial infarction, you have innovation, um, irritation of the phrenic nerve that can lead to referral to your um, left shoulder and chin and your arm. So that referral pain is important for that sense. So yeah, you, you should, you don't really need to know it in this context, in the pain context, but you should know it in that clinical context. Um, sorry, I hope that's helpful. That was a bit of a everywhere answer, but it is quite confusing. Spinothalamic is pain, temperature, and some touch. Hopefully you remember this. I remember making slides in this. And um, it's like crude, crude touch as well. Um, whereas dorsal column is like, proprioception two points. So don't worry about that. We're talking about spinothalamic when we're talking about pain. Opioids, opioid, oh, that's an unfortunate word not to be able to say in this presentation. Opioids act through stimulating new receptors. And these stimulate, these kind of help most of the analgesic effect and are also responsible for some of the main adverse events. Adverse events for you to remember are respiratory depression and dependence. Respiratory depression can lead to death and dependence can lead to addiction. And it's the first time I think that it's ever been recorded that the average health life has decreased in America. And that's because of the opioid epidemic. So quite an important adverse event that might not be on a public scale, whereas these are on a more patient scale, respiratory depression, but they both are important. You also delta and kappa receptors and they're less important than new receptors, but they do um, potentiate some of the analgesic effect. This is a lovely table with some oliprioids and their relative affinity and efficacy with new receptors. Um, you can see that this is all relative to morphine. You can see fentanyl is crazy and loperamide has none, which we'll discuss in a moment. And naloxone is an antagonist. So let me walk you through these. You give morphine for severe pain. Often you can also give it for chronic pain, but there's a very, they like have done studies on it and Opioids for chronic pains generally aren't a very good idea. It has damages to the individual and leading to dependency and also for society more generally. But um, morphine is generally poorly absorbed and so taken with IV. All of these drugs can be taken IV or orally, just often they have preferences. So you can take morphine orally. You just, there's no reason to, you should take it IV. I read some of those 20% that's effective. Um, codeine can, is usually taken orally. It's for more moderate pain. And it's more reliably absorbed. Fentanyl is crazy um, for moderate to severe pain, and it actually has other indications that are, um, I think it was cancer treatment, but other indications as well. But remember, fentanyl is crazy. Codeine is more like you can take home and take morphine, co oxycodone, thinking more you're getting these in a hospital. Heroin, you want to be avoiding if you can. Loperamide is interesting because it's not absorbed, so it stays in the guts. So it doesn't actually interact with neuroceptors. It has no affinity with neuroceptors, has no analgesic effect. And it's just involved because it increases drug motility, which is it's used as an indication in diarrhea. Naloxone is an antagonist often given to people who have overdosed. It interferes with the neuroceptor pathway. Um, treatment of overdose, it prevents respiratory depression and limits the effect of opioids. But if you're in pain or inflammation, it leads to hyperalgesia. So you feel more painful because your body releases endogenous opioids 
that interact with new receptors that interfere with pain transmission. So if you're giving naloxone, you're not allowing the body to interfere with pain transmission, which means pain is transmitted very effectively, which means it hurts a lot. Here are some effects and adverse events of morphine. I hope you like the colors. I just kind of, I'm colorblind, so I just got to guess. No, I can make out the colors, but sometimes I go a bit too crazy. Um, the effects of morphine are analgesic, and which can affect the transmission of pain through the spinal cord and also the final sensation through the brain centrally. It can lead to feelings of euphoria and dysphoria as well, but that would have two asterisks on it, and I don't understand it, so I didn't put it in. Not that high yield. You can lead to euphoria and can also cause sedation. Adverse events, so you have the slowing of the GI tract and lead to constipation. That's because um, morphine stimulates mu receptors. Mu receptors slow the motility of muscles in the GI tract, so you have constipation. Slowing motility means the peristalsis or the um, tubal like compression that pushes feces throughout is interfered with. So it's not as, as your bowel, like things aren't moving through your gut as, as effectively, so you get constipation. Um, nausea and vomiting, you might have heard of, very big adverse events. And it can lead to release of histamine, which can cause itching at the site of administration, but also bronchoconstriction and hypotension, which can lead to respiratory distress, which is depression, which is an important side effect. Of course, overdose is really important, that leads to depression. It can be treated with naloxone if it's done quickly enough. This is showing that. The adverse events of these opioids, opioids are just an extension of the therapeutic effect. So you can't have one without the other. They're very dynamic. So you have your analgesic effect, but at a higher dose, it leads to your adverse events and eventually to your respiratory depression, a cardiac arrest, an injury and death. The paramide very poorly absorbed, limited to the GIT, potent, potent antidiarrheal, non-analgesic effect. Um, often people take this when they travel, I take a paramide. Almost done. So opioid analgenics mimic encephalins um, and act as agonists in opioid receptors in the brain and spinal cord. So this is if you have local um, pain and inflammation, you're just going to get local anesthetic. And, and, uh, sorry, you're going to get NSAIDs if you have local inflammation and pain. If you want to um, close off a particular blood vessel, or to numb a particular agent, you'll give a local anesthetic. Um, and these just interfere with this initial upstream, sorry, this initial downstream signaling. Opioids interfere when it goes into your dorsal horn, and they can also interfere when it's you're registered in the brain in the cerebral cortex. We're going to talk about what encephalins are in a moment. They're very cool. So this is an encephalin. It is an endogenous kind of neurotransmitter produced by the body and it actually works through descending tracks so that's a bit confusing but your body sends descending tracks down to this nociceptive impulse to this afferent nerve fiber and this descending tract will leave and um, secrete encephalins which will then bind with new receptors and interfere with this transmission to the dorsal horn and subsequent um, upstream activation and through that ascending pathway upstream. These are also called endorphins. So you run as high that some people have experienced. I don't know any, but apparently some people have experienced them. That's due to a complete, like you run for so long, and you're like, everything hurts, but eventually you're releasing encephalins and um, endorphin. I don't even know the word. I'm so unfamiliar with it. And endorphins that you're preventing this nerve impulse of pain actually feels quite good. Again, apparently, these are interneurons that release encephalins. Remember, they are descending. They are down, down um, they're not ascending fibers, they're descending fibers. Whereas these nerve fibers that are afferents are ascending. They're going to um, synapse with the dorsal horn and ascend. I hope that makes sense. It's quite hard. Tell me if it doesn't. I'll go back. Encephalins are small peptide transmitters released from interneurons as part of the descending pathway. Morphine mimics them, and they're abundant in the brain and spinal cord. So are the descending? Yep, they are. So if you think, so the question is, are descending, what's the question? Are descending interneurons different to efferent fibers? 
So it's a good question. If we have, uh, this is our dorsal horn. This is our ventral horn. Ventral dorsal. This is your afferent fiber. A typical way to think of it is this is your afferent fiber. This is your interneuron. This is your efferent fiber. So they're completely different types of fibers. These encephalins are acting over here as an interneuron from the descending pathway. So they're not efferent fibers, they're not afferent fibers, they're descending fibers from the brain. Does that make sense? So if you think of a reflex arc as well, it goes afferent, interneuron, efferent. Yep, no worries. Um, activation of opioid receptors by enkephalin inhibit the fiery nociceptive, nociceptive afferent fibers, nociceptive is pain, and opioid receptors inhibit pain transmission. So our inhibitors are nerves where they are located. In the mu receptors are in the brain and they inhibit nociceptive sensation. That's the extent you need to know. Treatment of chronic pain is quite contentious. Does this mean no afferent slash efferent fibers in the spinal cord? So there are afferent and efferent fibers in the spinal cord. Um, let me draw a picture for you. There are afferent and efferent fibers in the spinal cord. Uh, I hope I fully understand the question. I'll do my best. So this is your spinal cord, this cross section. So this is an efferent fiber in your spinal cord, technically. It goes from a spinal cord out to your spinal cord. There, I don't know any, so efferent fibers go to muscles or affected tissues outside of the CNS. Afferents go from the PNS into the CNS. So if your question, are there efferent fibers just in the CNS? I don't know, but I would probably say no. I think afferent is sensory. You can only have sensory from an environment outside the CNS. You need something to sense. Whereas um, efferents, you, need, you can only act on glands or muscles. They don't convey, you can't, there's not like an effector that is con communicating between these two. And these are called interneurons. Katja, do you agree with that? Peter, do you agree with that? Yeah, um, I think your, your logic is definitely right, um, David. Unless it's like an example we don't know about, but I agree with what you were saying. Yeah, it's very possible that there is but I can't think of one. And you definitely don't definitely haven't been taught any. Um, quite content, good question. Chronic pain, quite contentious because they require long-term opioids, which have significant risk of addiction. They may contradict the goals of pain management, pain management, which is to increase the self-efficacy of the patient, um, reduce their dependence on healthcare system and um, promote their um, reduced pain behavior rather than just passivity. passivity. Also, um, Katya gave a lecture on this once, but there's kind of negative reinforcement where whenever you feel like you're in pain, you have opioids, so you don't do anything actively to combat that pain. So it's important to make people feel self efficacy and autonomous as possible for better outcomes ultimately. This is the hardest part from my opinion. There are other descending pathways other than those descending neurons, the other than those encephalins that can drive analgesic effect through the release and action of neurotransmitters. I know two. There are two to know, neuroadrenaline and 5-HT, and these inhibit pain transmission at the dorsal horn. So I gave you a simplistic view before where you had your, um, this is going into your dorsal root and you had an interneuron here. You actually have a lot of interneurons affecting it. So in answer to your question, I think that's like a similar differentiation between ascending and descending tracks. Like you don't call descending tracks effector fibers, even though ultimately they're going to synapse at a place that's going to lead to an effector fiber. So I think in the CNS, you think of it as ascending and descending fibers. And when they're going into the peripheries, you think of it as afferent and efferent. That more is a, me a memory mechanism than a definition, explanation. 
Um, so these may release noradrenaline and inhibit pain transmission at the dorsal horn. These are utilized clinically. So noradrenaline and 5-HT can inhibit nociceptor transmission at the dorsal horn and this underpins analgesic efficacy. These mechanisms are less likely to lead to dependence and respiratory depression compared to opioids. However, their adverse effects on nausea and vomiting because 5-HT is a potent stimulate, stimulator of nausea and vomiting. They're also sometimes used as antidepressants. And, oh, you did, you've done shingles. So, you know, in post-hepatic neurology, sometimes they give antidepressants to treat it. And that's probably to do with that pain pathway. I don't have a full understanding of that. This is an analgesic ladder, which means you don't really want to give someone strong opioids immediately because it has very strong adverse effects and you don't want dependency. So you're going to start with your non-opioids, your NSAIDs, and your simple analgesics. So simple analgesic paracetamol, your NSAIDs, ibuprofen, aspirin, then your weaker opioids like tramadol, including tramadol is not really it. Tramadol has that 5-HT neuroadrenaline. Codeine has that, um, codeine is an opioid. It's like 0.2 of morphine. Morphine is a strong opioid. 5-HT is serotonin. Thanks, Katya. I definitely should have said that. Um, five. So strong opioids are morphine and oxycodone, which are a similar sort of efficacy with mu receptors. In practice, you want to assess the patient holistically and see if appropriate, consider their social circumstances, the impact of disease on them, and how treatable their condition ultimately is. Trial other reasonable therapies first. And the main problems to know is long treatment, long-term treatment of chronic pain is associated with health and societal problems, and ceasing opioids abruptly after prolonged use will cause withdrawal symptoms. A harmonization effort is used to control this opioid epidemic, which is to encourage health seeking behavior and not treat people like criminals, but treat them like a health disease, to improve access to treatment and recovery service, to promote the availability and access to overdose reversing drugs like naloxone and through public health surveillance. That's all for me. David, that was awesome. I learned so much of you going through the slides, so thank you. Um, pop health. Um, just a thing for you guys to know, pretty much I've uploaded the finished pop health slides um, onto the like topic slides page. Um, so they're all up there in case anytime you want to go back and plus see what's going to be coming up. Um, David, do you want to share or do you want me to share? Um, let's let you share so you can control Yeah, the I'll course. share. All right. Thanks very much. Um, so today we're looking at, oh, <laughs> not actually sure. <laughs> um, today we're looking at a bunch of random things, actually. Um, and the first kind of random thing we'll be looking at is population parameters, um, hypothesis, specifically null hypothesis, and intention to treat. Um, so intention to treat versus completed therapy uh, refers to what type of data people use when they're analyzing the results of an experiment. Um, so when you do an experiment, whatever it is, let's say you're trying to investigate um, the effects of like an exercise on weight gain and exercise is your intervention. And you might have like treatment, like you might have like get each person to like walk 10,000 steps a day. There'll inevitably be people who don't take your treatment. So whether that's because you have like a drug or medication they just don't remember to take, they don't want to take, they drop out. Um, in like cancer studies, they might die prematurely, um, they might like move across states. So there are plenty of reasons why people might not complete the whole treatment. And the question is like, do you use their data? If they like stopped halfway through, do you still use their data or do you completely ignore it? And this kind of surprised me, but the general consensus is that for an RCT, so a randomized controlled trial, you do use the data. So you use their data even if they've dropped out. So it's called using the intention to treat group rather than the completed therapy. Um, and the reason for that is that they think if you use only the people who completed it, it's not like a random trial anymore. It's like you start getting like cohort statistics. So if you're using people, if we're back to our experiment about the walking and the weight gain, if you're using people who, um, who just didn't drop out, like all the ones who had like completed all the walking, maybe on average, they're more fitter, the metabolism is higher than like the average person. But the whole idea with an RCT is that your groups are supposed to be even. 
So that's why you use all data, even those who are dropped out of certain groups. Um, so it, yeah, that kind of, you, the way that would be asked in the exam is just like a definition kind of of intention to treat or potentially ask which one to use, but that comes up quite rarely. Um, these are some of the words that you talk about when you're referring to like populations. So a parameter is just your fixed numerical sum that summarizes a characteristic of the entire population, oh, the entire population. A sample statistic is a sample from the population. So let's say I was studying height or something, a sample might be 170 centimeters. Standard error is a distance from the sample statistic to the population parameter. Um, so that just means, um, like for instance, if I was studying height, my parameter might be like the median height, which is like, a, let's say it's 180. Let's say I was studying height in like athletes or something. Um, and my sample statistic, let's say that was 170. So my standard error there is like 10 centimeters for that particular one. Um, and standard error is used for like each kind of statistic you get to calculate an overall standard deviation, which is how like far your data is from the mean. Oh, it's from the median. Uh, confidence interval is the interval around the sample statistic, which we think will capture most of like the data. So for instance, if I was doing height in athletes and I was saying 180, was my median, my confidence interval um, might be 165, and because it has to be even on both sides, 295. So that means that in this data study on athletes and the confidence interval, let's say it's 95%, I'm 95% certain that all my data kind of falls within this range. So there's some data that will fall like outside the range. The confidence interval is just like how certain you are that particular statistic will fall within that range. So 95% certain that Freddie will fall in this range or anyone else. Um, confidence interval for difference between two means. Sometimes we also have a confidence interval, so like a range when we're trying to talk about the difference between two averages. So we're doing like heights in like female athletes versus male athletes. And then a confidence interval, depending on like the range between female and male, um, it can't include zero. Because if it includes zero, it means that there is no difference. Because zero as like a, that it means there's no difference between the two groups. If you're saying that your confidence interval includes between zero and like 10 centimeters difference. So you just can't include zero. Um, and just as convention, we love Greek letters. You saw that in David's lecture, there's a bunch of Greek letters. Um, so, yeah. A hypothesis. For hypothesis, we have a kind of a new term coming in, and that's the idea of the null hypothesis. So, in high school, maybe when you're doing an experiment, it was like, oh, my hypothesis is that, like, so and so. And then at the end of the experiment, you might say, oh, my hypothesis was not achieved. Um, well, now instead of saying that second bit, not achieved, you have a null hypothesis. So the null hypothesis means that there is no association. So if my hypothesis was people who smoke get a little more likely to get lung cancer, then the null hypothesis is that people who smoke are not more likely to get lung cancer. It's like there is no association between smoking and lung cancer. So when like you conclude an experiment, you either say your hypothesis was accepted, which is the alternative hypothesis, or you say that the null hypothesis um, was accepted in the end. That's just like kind of a new term. Um, there are also two types of errors we have to consider, type one error and type two error. error. And there's that diagram down the bottom that I feel like most kids had in their mind when they're thinking of type one, type two error in the exam. It's a very common error. Um, pretty much type one error is just like a false positive. Um, so it's you've rejected a null hypothesis. You said there was no connection between smoking and lung cancer. Um, even when it's true. And type two error is you accept the null hypothesis when it's not true. Um, so like, yeah, the diagram I think helps sum this up really well. All right, distribution terms. Um, our data can be skewed to like one side or the other. If it's in the middle, that's normal. And your mean is the same as your median, which should be the same as a mode. If it's negatively skewed, the way I used to like to think about it, was it kind of trails off 
in a negative direction. Um, and it just means a lot of your data is here, like a lot more positive than it would be. And positively skewed means it trails off in the positive direction, which means a lot more of your data is centered around here as well. Um, so just, this wasn't really tested per se, but just some terms to keep in mind. Um, oh, okay, now this kind of next few slides is a bit hard to get because we aren't really taught it properly, um, just like more on a superficial basis. Pretty much when you have data, at the end of the day, there are a couple of ways you can like analyze your data. And depending on what type of data you have, you analyze it differently. Um, so we'll talk about continuous data, we'll talk about non-continuous data, and there are like certain like methods you have to use for like each one. It's kind of like how we're talking about like relative risk and odds ratio before we can only use those for like certain types of studies. Um, you don't have to know like how to do this, you just have to kind of remember when sort of each one is used. So when we have an only when we have continuous data, we can use a t-test or we can use an ANOVA. T-test is all about the means. So your one sample t-test, that's the name, compares the sample mean to a hypothesized value. Like I think that the average athlete is um, 180, that's my hypothesized, and my sample mean was 170. So that like one sample t-test tells me how different the sample was from the, what I hypothesized it should be. Two sample t-test is when you compare two means from two separate groups. So male versus female height, um, I know, height in athletes versus non-athletes, two different groups. So two t-test, two means. Pair t-test is when you're comparing the same sample, so the same person, before and after. So if you were doing diabetes, maybe glucose levels before treatment, after treatment. Um, or if you're doing, yeah, like weight changes, weight change before, weight change after, weight after. And ANOVA is just when comparing more than two groups. So t-test, one sample is for like one group, two sample and pair test is also kind of for like two measurements. ANOVA is whenever you want to do more than that. And you don't need to know like what an ANOVA is. It's a very complicated kind of computer generated calculation. So you never have to figure out how the mechanics of it work. Um, so that was all for continuous. When we're talking about categorical, we have like the, these kind of next six. The biggest one that might come up that you won't be familiar with is the chi squared test. So don't confuse that with the T test. Um, so this is for categorical. So chi squared is between two categoricals. And so that's like checking the association between like a, the profession and smoking. So those are both categorical because that's not actually like a number. Like glucose concentration, that's not like a number. But being like a doctor or like smoking, yes or no, that's like not a number. Um, and then odds ratio, well, you guys should probably know odds ratio really well right now. That's for case control studies. Um, and if odds ratio is less than one, it means that the odds of exposure in one cases is less than in controls. So like maybe if, I don't know, I was trying to study the odds of um, lung cancer in like people who work in like forests because like they have like, much more fresh air. I don't know. Um, odds ratio is one. It means that the exposure, um, odds of exposure is the same. So like stuff that's not connected. So like um, the color of your cup and the amount of water you drink hopefully isn't connected. An odds ratio um, greater than one means that the odds of exposure on cases is greater than controls. So these are all for categorical. We also have relative risk, which we used um, in cohort studies usually, and kind of the same thing below with the risk ratio. And we also have something called a hazard ratio. It hasn't really come up except in lectures, but I thought I included just in case it did. Um, so like odds ratio and relative risk, they're all kind of like cumulative risk, like they measure risk over a period of time. Whereas hazard risk is, risk is like the risk you have right now. So like what's the risk right now that you'll die of a heart attack? Not like in your life or not like because of the exposure, but like right now, what's the chances you're gonna die? Or what's the chance you're gonna fall off a roof like right now if you're on a roof? Um, so yeah, that was for the categorical continuous. Now we have types of regression. There's two types, linear regression and logistic regression. And this is pretty much describing like the type of graph you might see. 
So linear regression is kind of your standard, you know, x, y plotting graph. Uh, for those who did further, that's when you have your, like, your r, correlation coefficient, or r squared, determination of the correlation coefficient. Um, and it's between two continuous variables. So like you usually, or it can be between one, like height, or it can be between two, like height and weight, or I don't know. Um, but that's a linear regression continuous. A logistic regression is when we have one continuous and one categorical. Um, so a continuous variable could be like height, a categorical variable could be like how happy you are. Um, so it also has like a category, but also has to be ordinal. So a couple weeks ago, we talked about the types of data. So make sure it can be ordered. And here is an example of like the types of graphs you might have. So for a linear regression, it's a straight line, even when you have two variables, two continuous variables, it's still a straight line. And for a logistic, I still like to think that logistic has an S. So the graph is like an S-shaped curve. That's kind of the main way to figure out which one is which. Okay, and the last one, outbreaks and pandemics. Now you guys would be all over this just from life experience in the last two years. Um, but I thought I'd include it here just because it is part of the lectures. So an outbreak or an epidemic is more cases than expected of a particular disease in a specific group of people in a given area in a particular period of time. So even if it affects like only one type of people or like one species, it still counts as an epidemic. Um, point source epidemic is just when susceptible individuals are exposed simultaneously to one source of infection. So it's like if the, if the pandemic came from like water and like they all drank the same water. It's a, that's like the point source, like the, the point of infection was the water. Uh, pandemic is just a worldwide epidemic. So epidemic um, is more restricted to a particular area. Pandemic is more worldwide. Um, cluster is a group of aggregation of cases. And endemic is, for instance, like the flu, something that, yeah, it increases over a particular period of time, but it's regular. So every year we kind of expect the flu to increase around June, July. It goes up. A lot more people have it, uh, but it's not more than we expected because every year it kind of goes up and then goes down. Um, this is relatively high yield. I remember a question on the exam which I got wrong on this. So as always, you remember the questions got incorrect so well. And I think we had to, it was like the graph to like define one of the words and I just couldn't remember them for the life of me. They're all very straightforward though. So hopefully you guys won't have that problem. Uh, so on the right is like a diagram I highly recommend you just draw it out once and it'll sink into your brain. The latent period is the time from infection, so like from, I guess, ex exposure to the pathogen until the infectious period starts. So like when you're exposed to the cold, maybe you're not infectious until like three days after. Infectious period is the time when you can transmit the disease to someone else. Incubation period. Um, is more about the symptoms. So it's a period between exposure, so you're exposed to the cold, someone sneezed on you, and the start of like the actual symptoms. So for some diseases like chickenpox, um, the latent period is quite long. I believe it's like two weeks or something like that. And you might be infectious before you start having symptoms. So you can see in the diagram below here, how your infectious period, like when you start being infectious, is before you're actually showing symptoms, um, which is unfortunate because then you can spread it to people when you don't know you have it. And symptomatic period is just when you have symptoms. Very straightforward. Um, just some definitions. Index case, the first case, case zero, um, but we don't necessarily know it. Uh, whereas primary case is the case like that we do know, the case we can trace back to. Secondary case is like any case that's from the primary case. Reproduction rates, the number of people that each case infects. So if it's more than one, that's bad. If it's less than one, the disease will eventually disappear over time. Immunity, when you're exposed and you're, you make antibodies and you're immune to it. Um, and then herd immunity depends on the particular virus, how much you need. These are kind of the epidemic curves. Um, so a point source curve kind of looks like you have like a little peak, you have a gap, and then you have like a, like a like another kind of normal peak. Um, common continuous source, so like something that's regularly 
supplied. So a point source, for instance, would be like um, contaminated fish and then people ate it. Common continuous source would be something like, um, I don't know, if there was a disease from like pollen and like pollen just continuously happens. And propagated source is when um, it just like comes a bit more in waves, I guess a bit more like curve in that sense, when the disease is transmitted between people and the curve has like taller and taller, taller peaks. And I think that is it. Yeah, that's it. Done, done guys. Thank you for sticking throughout the session. I might just add one thing. Yeah, go ahead. I have made a mistake. And so the lecture you have this week is on epidemiology and emergent infections. And I did mine on strategies for control. The reason why I made the mistake is the start of the lectures are the same. They're both about um, like direct contract, indirect contact. So you haven't missed out too much because it's essentially just epidemiology catch I went through and the transmission I went through. Plus, I have it up now, plus what an R rate is, which is just how many how infectious it is um and that's it so we'll make i'll make slides for this sorry about that i won't take long to make i hope but yeah we we, we did go through about three quarters of it i just got to fix that up. that's my bad yeah so we'll put slides up asap and then we'll present it next week that doesn't overlap Thanks, everyone.